Yeah, I am uh, right. I uh, uh, starting about 20 years ago, uh, discovering and researching Indian civilization, how it's treated, how it's studied by Indians, by outsiders, as a part of my own learning, uh, led me to a whole lot of uh, issues. So I do both the uh, disruption of what I consider to be a problem by exposing it. In my previous book, Invading the Sacred and, and being diff Breaking India, I did that, as well as constructing a new way of looking at things, a positive new way of looking at things. So uh, the one book I'm working on is in the, dis in the disruption uh, category. Uh, it uh, deals with a nexus of scholars, particularly in the United States, who are immensely powerful and very popular, who have reinvented or re reinterpreted Sanskrit and its texts in a way that the tradition would not accept. But they have done it with, in such a smooth way and such a lot of, with a lot of charm and charisma and a lot of diplomacy that most people who are practicing Vedantins or Hindus or uh, from the Dharma side would not consider, would not suspect that there is a problem. In fact, uh, ever since I started problematizing this, I have sent some of their works to people who ought to know better but do not find anything wrong. And the reason is that the writing is very dense and most people sort of look at the beginning, look at the end, see what the person said in public statements, in newspapers and that all seems very politically correct. But you have to decode the dense writings very deeply to understand what is going on and that is what I am doing here. The central figure is a very important uh, professor now at Columbia, his name is Sheldon Pollock and Pollock has a whole uh, kind of a lineage that he's created of Sanskrit scholars, most of them from India, some of them are Westerners and the idea is for him to train these people into his way of thinking, send them back to India, then they become uh, authors, they become scholars, they become intellectuals and they spread that knowledge and this is how a whole army of thinkers along his wavelength are created. A prominent example being Ananya Vajpayee who writes for the Hindu and who uh, very uh, radically anti-Modi, radically anti-Hindu, uh, a champion of Kam Kashmir separatists and things of that sort. Uh, she is a product of uh, Sheldon Pollock, uh, went and got her PhD under him and learned to think the way he thinks. So all these scholars are given, uh, they, when they are brought from India, they are already sort of radicalized, uh, they are leftist kind of people, they are brought from places like JNU and uh, they are angry, uh, but they do not have the skills of uh, Sanskrit. So the, traditionally the Indian left did not know Sanskrit, Ramila Thapar, Irfan Habib, these sort of people did not know Sanskrit. So they were always at a handicap that they are criticizing something and, they, and people could say, well, you do not really understand it. So that is where Sheldon Pollock comes in. He supplies them with the knowledge or enough knowledge to be able to debunk it. But his strategy is to be exceedingly politically correct and not say things that are very easy to pick up. So I will give you some examples. He takes the view that Sanskrit is inherently a hegemonic language which has a lot of oppressiveness built into it and he quotes from ancient sources, oppression against Dalits, oppression against women, oppression against minorities. He, that is his core thesis, that it is a language of abuse and we should popularize Sanskrit. He is considered the champion of Sanskrit revival today, but his idea of reviving Sanskrit is to bring in new kinds of people who will give this point of view and kind of take over Sanskrit studies from, a, from another uh, angle. He also believes that uh, Ramayana was very obscure and the Ramayana, there was no Ram cult until Hindu kings needed to unify against the, uh, against the Muslims. So he believes that from the 12th century to the 15th century as a reaction against the Turks, the Hindu kings unified and created this huge Ramayana, Ram cult and started building all these temples as a way to mobilize people and rabble rouse them by demonizing Muslims as the Rakshasas. So the, uh, the king became like Ram and the noble person, the uh, enemy was the Muslim, the Rakshasa, Ravand who had to be defeated and he feels that that is the primary role that Ramayana has played for the past almost thousand years and therefore this whole Ayodhya issue has to be seen in the light of Ramayan being a weapon against Muslims from you know hundreds of years ago. So that is his idea of Ramayan and he is very well known for his critical edition of Ramayan that he has, uh, he has authored and he has translated. He also believes in the Aryan Dravidian divide. Uh, without 
looking at the data without establishing his case that there is a foreign Aryan, uh, for Ar Aryans in Sanskrit and all these things were imported by foreign people from somewhere, without establishing the case, he just assumes the conclusion. And so it, these are a few examples of a lot of things that uh, he has written. Another example is he has correlated what he considers to be uh, oppression built into Sanskrit uh, uh, literature. He's correlated that with Nazis. And he says that the Germans were studying Sanskrit and that is what led them to the Holocaust against the Jews. So it's a pretty uh, tough, uh, a pretty intense allegation uh, to make. Now, what uh, made me interested in uh, Pollock and his group of thinkers is that, first of all, I found that uh, Narayan Murthy gave him millions of dollars to be in the editor in charge of translating ancient Indian texts into modern vernacular, modern English. And I was surprised that, uh, now Sheldon, I mean, Narayan Murthy is an expert on IT, and if he were to give money for some IT, I could believe he's an expert, knows how to do it. But he's not an expert on these things. And I doubt that he consulted an expert who could evaluate this and do the due diligence required before you know, making such a decision. But it was prestigious uh, because uh, Sheldon Pollock is linked with, he's at Columbia, he was at University of Chicago, he's linked with Harvard University, the whole series is being developed jointly under his guidance. So given the prestige associated, a lot of our billionaires are sucked into the glamour and the limelight and the, the elitism that comes with, you know, hey, I got, I'm known in Harvard now, I'm known in Columbia now, that sort of a thing. So this is sort of the billionaire, Indian billionaire syndrome. Maybe it's, uh, maybe deep down they have an inferiority complex, they want to sort of establish they're not any worse off than the white people because they have the money and they can spend the money, but it's not being done wisely. Of course, he has a right to do it. I'm not saying uh, I have a right to stop him or anything. I'm not in a position to do that, but I have a right to criticize. I have a right to my opinion, and that's all I'm giving. Then I found that a number of others, a number of others, India gave him uh, Padam Shiri and uh, awarded him as sort of Sanskrit scholar of the year. Because he has a good, solid number of powerful people that he has taught and sent them back, and then they are his army who do all this political stuff uh, uh, you know, on his behalf. Uh, I've had a, a, a recent conversation about a month ago with him. He came over to Princeton where I live and we had a nice chat for a, a few hours. And I told him very clearly there's nothing personal against him. It is just that his scholarship uh, has some issues. And nobody has taken up his scholarship or that of his whole school of thought and analyze it, uh, analyze it uh, from an outside point of view, from a, particularly from a Hindu point of view. It, his, the only people who have commented are his own students who always kind of praise him like he's a god or something, you know, that he's sort of the, the ultimate authority on Sanskrit. So I feel that, uh, and, and another thing is very interesting, he constantly criticizes Indians' attempts to revive Sanskrit. So he doesn't want it as a spoken language because he's not himself articulate in terms of speaking it. He wants it as a language that scholars like him can study as out, from outside the tradition. And he's not even interested in the practicing aspect of Sanskrit, where the Sanskrit is mantra, the Sanskrit is used for meditation purposes. He wants to use it as a lens to analyze India's social oppression, social class structure, and politic politics. So for him, Sanskrit, rather than being a spiritual language, which is how the tradition sees it, is a language that you can use to figure out what's wrong with these people. So that's, uh, that's where he's coming from. And I have a lot of respect for the hard work he's put in. He's put in a lot of hard work. Uh, but there are some blatant errors, blatant, serious mistakes in what he's saying, which we'll point, I'll point out in my book. Uh, and so that's my uh, next project. So I, I should clarify, uh, his problem is not with Sanskrit as a language, but with the text written in Sanskrit. So it is, it is the Vedic text, the Upanishadic text, the, the uh, Valmiki Ramayan, uh, it is all of the texts written in Sanskrit which are the issue that he has, not that the language itself. Uh, as far as the language itself is concerned, the only uh, problem I see in his approach is he does not want the spoken Sanskrit, which is how our tradition has always been taught. In fact, be, it, before it was written down, it was an oral tradition entirely. He is not favoring the oral tradition, spoken Sanskrit approach, but the literate, writ, written approach. And the analysis of what words mean 
and what is the intention of this phrase or that shloka is largely coming from a western point of view. So, he is bringing western what we call what they call western hermeneutics which is the theory of interpretation and hermeneutics were developed in, in order to interpret the Bible and so it has a Judeo Christian origin and then it was secularized to become more general. But it has that sort of a DNA, the basic core ideas are the way westerners would look at things. So, he is looking at the Indian tradition from a non-traditional lens. So, in a sense you could say it is a colonization, uh, that is how uh, Indology started in, in Britain. It was in the pretext of we love your culture, we want to take all your original texts to England and Oxford and we are going to study them and Indians were very impressed, the Rajas were giving them all these texts to take them to England. But what they were studying is how from their point of view, how to make sense of these Indians that we are going to rule over, how to doctor them up, how to re-educate them, uh, how to get them away from their traditional way of thinking uh, to a different way of thinking. And that had a huge impact in uh, influencing Indian mindset and the minds got colonized. So, I see that now that same project is going deeper. Uh, the previous project was to get them away from Sanskrit, anglicize them, that was the Macaulay project. And now it is let them understand Sanskrit, but seen through our point of view. And also the leaders with the Adhikar, they are criticizing Brahmins having Adhikar, but Pollock now has the Adhikar. They are criticizing Brahmins having the power, but Columbia University with millions of dollars that Indians are giving him has huge power. I mean, they, they are controlling the journals, the conferences, who gets the PhDs, who is legitimate. Uh, his students get to write in prestigious journals, prestigious New York Times, Washington Post, uh, the, the Council on Foreign Relations. Because of their clout, they are able to position their ideologies and their spin. So, for instance, the latest issue of Foreign Affairs, which is a leading international relations journal in the United States, read very widely. The latest edition that just came out a couple of days ago, right at the time of coinciding with Modi's visit, has a very anti-Modi, anti-Hindu article by a Sheldon Pollock student. So, this is how power is uh, being asserted. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's, a story, that's the subject of a lot of my writings, a huge writing. I'm doing one more book, which is my own interpretation of these texts, but in line with the tradition. So, I feel that these ancient traditions, our traditions can be separated as Shruti and Smriti. Uh, Shruti being that which is eternal and Smriti being that which is man-made, constructed interpretations and so on. And these interpretations are supposed to be redone every era, every time, place and context. So, we are not frozen in time. Like in the Abrahamic uh, traditions, they have frozen books. The book is permanent, it's closed, it cannot be, you cannot update it. Uh, but in our, in our case, the Shrutis are permanent, but uh, the Smritis, which is what uh, most of our texts are, are supposed to be updated. So, all our social codes, whatever is wrong with society, we are supposed to update it and there are plenty of things wrong with society. We are supposed to update those with minorities, women, caste, whatever. These are things that we have to revisit and update from time to time and it is not a violation of uh, any uh, code that says you can't change these. We are allowed to change them. So, the first point uh, I want to emphasize is the, the reinterpretive nature of our texts is a very important thing. Yeah? Uh, but these reinterpretations have always been done from within the Indian system. The Indians have been very debate oriented, uh, very uh, kind of argumentative reform oriented. Uh, we have had debates with Buddhists, we have had with the Bhakti movement, we have had so many uh, kinds of movements that did not require a colonial power to come in with a danda and say, okay, you do it our way. So, what is different in this, what bothers me in this is not the reinterpretation which has been done all many times, but the, the nexus from where it is being done, the political, rep, the, the political force they represent and who is privileged and has the adhikar or authority to do this and who is kept out and who makes the decisions and choices of who gets in and who does not get in a seat at the table. So, I, I, what, I, what upsets me is that the control of our interpretation for the next generation, in a sense writing new smritis, writing 21st century smritis for Hindus is being done by people based somewhere else with their ultimate allegiance somewhere else and they are marketing this and spreading it through Indians who are very bright, exceedingly talented, good looking, well spoken, smart Indians who get sucked into this and, and that is exactly like what the British did. So, I started this whole issue in my book uh, Invading the Sacred. I, uh, over a dozen years ago, I critiqued Wendy Doniger like I am critiquing Sheldon Pollock. At that time, 
she was unknown in India, only her students knew her, but this was a very uh, strong uh, group of students she had produced for a particular ideology. And in fact, uh, just like Sheldon Pollock is unknown, but I think he will also become pretty known after my book comes out. So before all these people like Batra and all of them who started this fight recently with her, they didn't even know anything about it. I wrote a lot of critiques on her books. My critiques are quite different from the new critiques that have come out against her. I never asked for pulping, I never asked for banning a book, I just asked for equal space to debate. And the issues I had were, they, she, her work was using a particular theory which is called Freudian psychoanalysis. So she looks for sexuality in everything. So uh, Ganesh's trunk symbolizes a limp phallus, so which means that Indians are worshipping a limp phallus. That is her theory. Uh, uh, the, you know, uh, uh, Krishna, because he stands this way, the hip, his hip sticking out shows it's a homosexual uh, move on his part. So he is gay. Uh, when Rama, Sri Ramakrishna invites Vivekananda, uh, who was a young boy at the time, come sit on my lap, which is something uh, Indian man would do in Indian culture. It is not anything which has homosexual or sexual connotations. It shows that is the one evidence of all the whole, all the texts that they could find to say that uh, Vivekananda was sexually abused by Ramakrishna. Uh, Gita is a dishonest book. It promotes genocide, God's genocide. So these are some, a few of the things that I, I, I have to tell you, which I picked out from the works of herself and her students, along with many errors in, uh, blatant errors in the way Sanskrit texts were being translated. And the whole idea of the goddess uh, being sort of an oversexed, all these are quotes from her and her students' writings, an oversexed woman uh, hungry for uh, sexual power. So it's the, uh, you know, when I critique this, that this is not how the tradition sees itself, and a religion is basically, uh, the purpose of religion is for those who believe it and practice it, and then it should be studied uh, out of respect for how they're seeing it. So you can criticize how, how they are seeing it, but you cannot impose another view of how you are seeing it just because you are an outsider. So this business of uh, you know, oppressing the practitioner's view and superimposing what I think is a colonizer's view, training a huge army of what I call Indian intellectual sepoys, uh, sort of like the British sepoys. Uh, they are Indian intellectual sepoys who go around getting book awards. Uh, they're famous because they're very slick in speaking English. They come to literary festivals, and there's nobody allowed, nobody invited to oppose them. No, uh, Doniger and her friends gone to all these prestigious literary festivals. No opposing voice ever invited to say, okay, here is what's wrong with them. So they are put up on a pedestal like some Gora Sabs of the past and, and turned into like the new gods and goddesses. That is an issue for me. Now, the Freudian psychoanalysis as a theory has been discredited by the Westerners themselves. It is no longer in vogue uh, in the West as a theory to analyze, you know, Bill Clinton or to analyze some, you know, what is wrong with Obama or something. People aren't using Freudian psychoanalysis to analyze Western personalities. But this training that she has received and other people received in Freudian psychoanalysis, it was fair game to apply it on Hindu icons, symbols, gurus, texts or festivals, holidays, all of that seen through a sexuality. Now, Hinduism is not, no, nothing unsexual or anti-sexual about it. Uh, it is not that we are afraid of sex. It is not that sex is a bad thing according to us. It is not. I mean, we have a plenty of that in our texts. But let's not uh, distort things which have a certain purpose just to fit a theory of somebody who can then become very popular and become very pioneering and say that that's, I'm the originator of this theory, so I'm very powerful. Just to make certain scholars feel very powerful over us and feel like they are the ones who control our discourse, uh, for them to come up with this new innovation interpretation and exclude the traditional voice completely from, uh, from a seat at the table, I thought was wrong. So I took it upon myself about a decade ago to start writing a whole lot of blogs on the internet the first one I called it Wendy's Child Syndrome. So I considered those people to be Wendy's children, that they are her offspring, like there's Macaulay's children. So I created that uh, phrase, Wendy's Child Syndrome, and that caught on. And I gave, uh, I wrote essays on Wendy's issue, uh, the problematizing her, and then student number one, number two, number three, number four, all of these kind of people. 
And so this became a very big uh, movement. And uh, I, there were people who wanted to ban and take legal action against them. And I never believed in any of that. I just thought that uh, if there is a discourse you don't like, then you write your own discourse against it. And a literary festival ought to invite both people and discuss it. But they wouldn't invite voices like me. So the book, Invading the Sacred, uh, became a very big seller. It was published by Rupa. It had this whole Wendy Doniger critique by me and my debates. Uh, there was a front page article in the Washington Post on my debates with uh, Wendy Doniger, uh, and an article also in the, another page in the New York Times. And University of Chicago Magazine, which is where Wendy Doniger is a big shot, itself interviewed me. And wrote a, they wrote actually a balanced article on what is her point of view and what is my opposing point of view. Yeah? And so this started a new discussion on, within the academy. And Freudian psychoanalysis of Hinduism lost the power and the glamour it used to have because of this intervention. Students are no longer going and getting their doctorates on how, what is, uh, was the goddess menstruating or not. This kind of a stupid thing was going on. This is what was uh, how the Indi Hinduism was being de deconstructed in the name of being very liberal and very fashionable. This is how it was happening. Yeah? So uh, the, that kind of a very blatant uh, Freudian psychoanalysis of Hindu, th Hindu thought and symbols and all that has stopped. So this was the end of my, that chapter in my life. And I moved on to writing other books like you mentioned, Breaking India and uh, Being Different and Indra's Net. And now I'm writing other books. So as far as Wendy Doniger's side is concerned, you know, many, many years ago, I just closed that chapter and moved on. But then something happened which I had nothing to do with, which is uh, her, one of her new books arrived in India. And some, meanwhile, my, uh, I had popularized among the Hindu diaspora and Hindus in this country uh, that there is a problem like this. So that thing was ticking on its own. And so some people that I had nothing to do with decided to take up this issue against her. Now, as far as my idea, so I've told you my views on Wendy. Now, my views on this new scandal and this new fight that erupted is as follows. If there is a law that allows banning books that hurt a community's sentiments, and this law has been used to ban Da Vinci Code because Christians were offended, and this law has been used to ban uh, Salman Rushdie's book because Muslims were offended, then Hindus also have a right to use the same law. Now, personally, I would rather not have such a law. Personally, I would say people should have the right to offend others. I should have a right to piss you off, Be as long as I'm doing it factually, as long as I'm doing it, I can authenticate how I'm doing it, as long as I'm not muzzling you and stopping you from a rejoinder, as long as I'm giving a talk and inviting you to come and be on the panel and criticize me and having a debate. And I've always done that. I've always invited people like Wendy Doniger, and the invitation is still open now to come and be on a panel and we'll talk about it. It is they who just don't want to because they're not used to having an opponent, you see. So I'm for free speech. I'm for open discussion and debates and arguments. And I'm, op I'm for the right to criticize others even if they're hurt, as long as I can, I can authenticate my position. So if I say Bill Clinton had an affair with Monica Lewinsky, the f point is that if I can authenticate that, it doesn't matter if he's hurt or not. You see, but if I were to make up something, that would be a problem. So uh, I, the communities have to become mature in this age of internet and open speech that others are going to uh, criticize you, and then you better have enough good scholars who can respond. So I, I, that's what I did for Hinduism. When Wendy Doniger was doing this Freudian psychoanalysis, I was a one-man uh, intellectual force trying to counter it. So I would like more Hindus to be like me, join me, and we, we can produce more intellectual content against it. Now, banning the book is not my style. But as I said, a person has a right to use the law to ban a book if such a law is available and if uh, such a law is being used by other religions. So it should not be one way. And if, 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 if the sentiments of a community are not to be hurt, then the same thing also should be benefiting Hindus. So that's how my uh, position is. I believe that Ramayana is a sort of a template which has been adapted for many purposes in many parts of the world. I used to have a business in Indonesia and uh, Bali I used to visit a lot. And they have their own idea of Ramayana. And in fact, there's a monkey forest in Bali. And they say that these are Hanuman's descendants in Bali. So you ask them, how did they get here? 
And they will say, well, when Hanuman was carrying the mountain, he's maybe lost, his GPS wasn't very accurate. He took a long tour and uh, he flew over that part of the world and some mountains dropped and became Bali and some of those monkeys are there. So it's a very nice story. And also in, uh, in uh, Thailand, there's a town called Ayodhya and they feel that's uh, Ram's Ayodhya. So people have localized a global template with their own local version and adaptation uh, for their own purposes. That is part of the beauty of Ramayana. Uh, there, is a, there is a Ramayana you'll find in Mongolia, you'll find Ramayana in most parts of Asia, some version of Ramayana. So I don't think that the, the, the general concept of many Ramayans is a problem. I don't consider that to be a problem. I do consider it to be a problem if they then take it further and say the whole thing is therefore a myth, that they, it never made, makes any sense, all these people just made it up. Because, you know, you don't have people with so many languages, ethnicities separated by thousands of miles just making up something where the same narrative sort of repeats itself. It just doesn't happen. So there is, to me, there is a reality and a truth to the narrative of Ramayana, what we call itihas. I do not like to translate itihas as myth because then myth means it's just a bunch of false stuff like, you know, Star Wars or some kind of a modern fiction. Uh, I don't think it's that way. And at the same time, I don't take the other view and say that this uh, itihas cannot be localized. Uh, so there is a modern term that marketing people have called glocalization, which means global localization. So like McDonald's says there's one McDonald's, but in China they, have, they sell chow mein and in India they sell paneer tikka or whatever they sell. And in France they sell wine in their uh, McDonald's. So that is the localization of a global brand and Coca-Cola does that and, you know, everybody does that. So uh, Ramayan is a global meta-narrative that got localized in many places, which I think is a success for Ramayan, not a weakness. And therefore, uh, I see this idea of multi, uh, many Ramayans as a positive thing. And I don't agree with the critics who feel that, therefore, this, this is something wrong that they are doing to us. We must know how to take this idea of multiple Ramayanas, many Ramayanas, and turn it into a positive quality. Because we don't have many Bibles. We don't have many Qurans. You cannot localize the Quran. You cannot even say that instead of pointing at the Kaaba, I'm going to point at my local mosque. So you cannot, so the fact that uh, many, some, many of the other traditions have a s standard canon and this canon is sort of one absolute thing and people cannot adapt it and we allow the Ramayana to be locally adaptable uh, is a positive thing and that is why I think it spread and continues to be in the hearts of people all over Asia. Yes, I agree with that. I agree fully with that, that not only Bengal but most of India had a lot of feminine energy and a lot of feminine spirituality. Every village I have been to, I've been to like Nagapatinam when they had the tsunami. I had a project there, I lived there for a while with the fishermen. And most of these villages got a Devi temple. They have a goddess temple of their own. So this uh, deeply rooted feminine culture with Tantra, uh, with the, uh, you know, the, the, the forms of the goddess and, and, and so on, has been part of Hinduism for a very, very long time. It did not fit the uh, Victorian, Elizabethan sensitivities. And so a lot of people, starting with Ram Mohan Roy, he's the culprit. I don't call him Raja. I think they appointed him Raja. He's no Raja. As far as I'm concerned, he's a bad guy because he, he's the guy who sold out. And in the name of reforming Hinduism, he's actually anglicizing it and Christianizing it and sort of quote unquote cleaning it up. Yeah. So uh, there were several victims of this. The whole Tantra movement went underground. And uh, this business of uh, monism, abstract, Vedanta and all that was boosted because it could fit in more with the, with the European sensi sensibilities. Max Miller translated so many of the so what he selected as the great works, but not Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. Thank God, because it didn't get distorted that way. So, so there was no uh, Western mapping into their categories of Yoga Sutra of Patanjali because it has to do with the body. And, and, and in Christianity, the body is suspect. The body is suspect because that's evil, it's sinful, particularly Eve who does all this mischief to Adam. So the woman is suspect, there's something wrong with her. So Christianity has had these kind of discomfort with the body, with sexuality and with women. And this mindset was superimposed and Indians 
unfortunately allowed it, like you download an app and it becomes you, the way you operate. So Indians from uh, Mon Ramon Roy onwards started downloading this app of a kind of a pseudo Christian, uh, you know, way of thinking and brought that in Hindu, in, that influence into Hinduism. And Tantra suffered, a lot of these kind of things suffered. Yoga was not, uh, was on the margins, it had to be revived later. Uh, another thing that was a victim is uh, people call the criminal tribes. The concept of tribe is a racist concept. I do not like it when they say tribal belt and whatnot. They are jatis. In our system, they are jatis. They are communities. Jati just means community. So the thug were, were demonized by the British because the, the thug jatis were not in favor of their, uh, their jungles being cut down for the railways and whatnot. Uh, they were, would uh, uh, kind of go and sabotage. Uh, and they were, they were like that. Yeah? So they were demonized as sort of evil people. They're Kali worshippers. They're drinking blood. All kinds of books were written during the British era to demonize the thugs. And people would send back reports on all the atrocities committed by the thugs so that they could be turned into criminals and exterminated. So the extermination of thugs and about 80 some uh, criminal tribes, so-called criminal tribes, was a holocaust, was a, which should be considered a genocide that the British did. And unfortunately, we Indians have adopted the word thug. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, if uh, somebody were to say Smiths, so you call somebody a Smith, that means he's a criminal and he's supposed to be, oh, no, no, I'm not a Smith kind of a thing. Thug is just a name of a community. And there's really, those guys from an Indian point of view are not bad guys. Uh, they were Kali worshippers and they were no nonsense. They were Kshatriyas, they were Kali worshippers and they just wouldn't want to put up with the British nonsense. And so we Indians are colonized when we use this kind of language.